Senate Armed Services Committee meets this morning to consider the nomination of General Mark Milley to be the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. We welcome you, General Milley, as a member, as well as members of the Milley family. As is our tradition at the beginning of your testimony, we invite you to introduce the members of your family who are joining you. We know the sacrifices your family has made, and we're grateful to them for their continued support of our nation. Thank you, Chairman McCain, and uh, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Reed, and distinguished members of the Senate Armed Services Committee for the privilege and opportunity to appear before you today. And I also appreciate the uh, confidence of the President of the United States and, and the General, Secretary of Defense. I, I was going to oh, I'm sorry, sir. ask if you would like to introduce your family. First, uh, <laughs> first Senator Reed and I have to emote for a while. Aha. Uh -huh. In that case, I shall introduce my family. <laughs> And my wife is here, Holly Ann, uh, off to my left over here, uh, sitting next to General uh, Richardson. And my son and daughter uh, are not here. They're both uh, working. Uh, my son Peter is down in Texas uh, working in the oil industry. And my daughter is also working in the oil industry. Uh, and she's uh, based out of Chicago. Uh, and I'm uh, very, very fortunate to have Holly Ann by my side for the last uh, 30 consecutive uh, years of uh, service. Well, thank you, General, and thank you. Uh, you come before this committee as part of a major transition of American military leadership. If confirmed as Army <coughs> Chief of Staff, you will serve alongside a new chairman and vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, new service chiefs for the Navy and Marine Corps. As part of this team, you will lead an army of volunteer soldiers that has proven itself time and again over a decade of war in Afghanistan and Iraq. The Army has endured 70 percent of the casualties in those wars. And as we all know, the untold sacrifices of our soldiers and their families did not end with their mission. As our nation confronts the most diverse and complex array of global crises since the end of World War II, the next Chief of Staff of the Army will be responsible for ensuring the total Army, active guard and reserve, remains the most decisive land force in the world. But unless Washington wakes up to the damage being done to our military right now by drastic reductions in defense spending, the Army will be forced to carry out its mission with fewer dollars, fewer soldiers, and aging equipment. Over the past few years, the Army's end strength has been reduced from a peak of 570,000 active duty personnel to 490,000 troops this year and just last week the Army announced it would cut an additional 40,000 troops over the next two years, reducing its end strength down to 450,000. If defense spending cuts continue, there is even talk that the Army could shrink to 420,000 troops. What's worse, only one-third of the Army's brigade combat teams are ready for deployment and decisive operations. In short, the Army is facing a downward spiral of military capacity and readiness that increases the risk that in a crisis we will have too few soldiers who could enter a fight without proper training or equipment. We're not cutting the Army because the world has become safer or threats to our security have been reduced. In fact, the opposite is true. As you have stated, General Milley, this is budget-driven force level reduction, and it rested on a series of assumptions that we were getting out of Iraq and Afghanistan and stepping back from the Middle East more broadly, that Europe was secure and U.S. forces could depart the continent, and that there was no need for significant deployments to Africa. Instead, we have seen the rise of ISIL, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the outbreak of Ebola, and the growing tensions in the Asia-Pacific region. I think you would agree, General, that when our assumptions about the world change, we must either adopt our conclusions to the new realities or scale back our ambitions to meet our reduced means. Instead, the administration and many in the Congress are trying to have it both ways, asking our soldiers to take on a growing set of missions with fewer and fewer resources. This is not just about reversing the effects of sequestration. It's about replacing the arbitrary spending cuts on defense that were imposed under the Budget Control Act of 2011. That is the only way we will get back to a truly strategy-driven defense budget. 
And yet, while I believe there is no strategic rationale for the Army's end strength to fall below its pre-9-11 level of 490,000 troops, in recent years the Army's headquarters and administrative staff have grown at the same time it's cut brigade combat teams. That, too, is wrong, and it only hurts the Army's credibility. This committee is embarking on a multi-year effort to make major reductions in headquarters and administration across the Department of Defense. If confirmed, General, I want you to be a relentless partner in this effort. Another priority for the next Army Chief of Staff is modernizing the force. The Army faces an enormous challenge in replacing, repairing, and reconditioning its equipment after 14 years of sustained combat. At the same time, the Army must continue to modernize to meet future, future threats. Programs like the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle and Armored Multipurpose Vehicle aim to enhance tactical mobility, command and control, medical evacuation, and other critical combat functions while significantly improving the protection and safety of our soldiers. Accomplishing these goals will require additional resources to be sure. But perhaps more importantly, it requires the Army to learn the lessons of its failed acquisition programs, a record that has been particularly dismal. From Comanche to Crusader, future combat systems to the ground combat vehicle, billions of dollars have been wasted on programs that never became operational. These and other failures also reflect the inefficiency and dysfunction that have crippled our defense acquisition system more broadly, unwarranted optimism in cost and schedule estimates, funding instability, requirements creep, immature technology, excessive risk-taking, and concurrency between testing and production. There are diverse views on acquisition reform, but one thing is for sure. The status quo is unacceptable. To provide our soldiers the equipment they need to defend the nation, we simply cannot continue to have blurred lines of ac accountability and evasions of responsibility inside the defense acquisition system. That's why in this year's National Defense Authorization Act, this committee adopted reforms to increase the role of the military services in the acquisition process and to create new mechanisms to ensure accountability for results. Among these reforms is an enhanced role for the service chiefs. The Army must ensure that its acquisition programs stay on schedule, within cost, and perform to expectations. And if that doesn't happen, General, we will be calling you. General, thank you again for be appearing before this committee today, and we look forward to your testimony. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to join you in welcoming General Milley this morning. Look, thank you for his many years of service to our nation and to the Army and for his willingness to continue to serve. And uh, General Milley has joined this morning by his wife, Holly Ann. Thank you, ma'am, for your service to the nation and to the Army. And uh, I also want to acknowledge Mary and Peter and wish them well. Uh, General Milley, if confirmed, you will oversee the Army during a time when the United States has faced a multitude of challenges abroad. While the conflict areas around the world continue to increase, the amount of resources devoted to the Army continue to decrease. Earlier this month, it was announced that over the next two years, the Army would convert two infantry brigade combat teams to battalion task forces. These changes were necessary in order for the Army to continue to reduce its end strength with a final goal of 450,000 soldiers by the end of fiscal year 2017. In addition to these reductions, the Army also intends to cut approximately 70,000 civilian personnel, although it is my understanding the Army has not identified which installations will be impacted by these reductions. If sequestration funding levels remain in place, the situation becomes much more ominous for the Army. Without any relief from the budget caps, the Army will need to reduce its end strength further to a level of 420,000 soldiers in the coming years. General, I hope you will share with us your views today on how to manage these reductions if, in fact, they're called for, and what, if any, impact uh, these reductions would have on the readiness of the Army. In addition to managing end strength reduction, the Army is grappling with how to modernize the force and increase readiness levels. In recent years, the Army has had to make tough choices on its major modernization programs. As the Army Equipment Modernization Strategy released in March 2015 acknowledges, the Army cannot afford to equip and sustain the total Army with the most modern equipment 
Therefore, we must acknowledge fiscal realities and we will selectively modernize equipment and formations. At the same time, the Army continues to cope with reduced readiness levels. General Ordiano, the current Chief of Staff of the Army, testified before the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense in March of this year that readiness levels are at historically low levels. Specifically, he stated that today only 33 percent of our brigades are ready, when our sustained readiness rate should be closer to 70 percent. General Milley, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on how the Army can make <coughs> targeted investments in modernization while also restoring readiness levels. The National Guard has always been an integral component to our nation's defense. In fact, today they're probably more integral than any time in our history. They serve as the first line of defense when there's a natural disaster at home, and they perform a vital homeland security mission. And without question, the role the National Guard and Reserve component played in both Afghanistan and Iraq was critical to our success on the ground. However, as the Army draws down and resources become more limited, there has been tension between the active and reserve components, the most notable example being the Army Restructuring Initiative. To ensure that the Army does not make any irrevocable force structure changes, last year the Congress created the National Commission on the Future of the Army to undertake a comprehensive review of the size and force structure of the Army. The Commission has been working diligently, meeting with stakeholders, performing site visits, and conducting hearings in order to provide the report to Congress by February 1, 2016. General Milley, if confirmed, you will be working closely with General Grass, Chief of the Army National Guard Bureau, and I look forward to hearing from you on how you envision the relationship between the active Army and the National Guard and Reserve components, and what, if anything, can be done to strengthen that relationship. Finally, I have repeatedly stated that sequestration is a senseless <coughs> approach to addressing our nation's fiscal challenges, and it undermines our national security and our military readiness. Defense budgets should be based on our long-term military strategy, not sequestration-level budget caps, and the Chairman's made this point eloquently and consistently, and I hope you will share our thoughts on this topic, your thoughts on this topic with the Committee today. Again, General, thank you for your service. General, there are standard questions that is asked of all military nominees, and I'd like to proceed with those before your opening statement. Uh, questions are as follows. In order to exercise its legislative and oversight responsibilities, it is important that this committee and other appropriate committees of the Congress are able to receive testimony, briefings, and other communications of information. Have you adhered to applicable laws and regulations governing conflicts of interest? <coughs> I have, Chairman. Do you agree when asked to give your personal views, even if those views differ from the administration in power? I do, Chairman. Have you assumed any duties or undertaken any actions which would appear to presume the outcome of the confirmation process? I have not, Chairman. Will you ensure your staff complies with deadlines established for requested communications, including questions for the record and hearings? I will, Chairman. Will you cooperate in providing witnesses and briefers in response to congressional requests? Yes, Chairman. Will those briefings be protected from re briefer? Will those witnesses be protected from reprisal for their testimony or briefings? Yes, they will, Chairman. Do you agree if confirmed to pr appear and testify upon request before this committee? I do, Chairman. Do you agree to provide documents including copies of electronic forms of communication in a timely manner when requested by a duly constituted committee or to con consult with the committee regarding the basis for any good faith delay or denial? in providing such documents. I do, Chairman. Thank you. Welcome, and please proceed. Uh, thanks, Chairman uh, McCain and uh, Ranking Member Reed and distinguished members of the Senate Armed Services Committee for the privilege and opportunity <laughs> to appear before you today. And I appreciate the confidence that the President of the United States and the Secretary of Defense have shown uh, by nominating me to be the next Chief of Staff of the United States Army. Uh, and thank you all uh, for your continued and unwavering support and commitment to the soldiers and civilians and families of what is your army. And as your army is the strength of our nation, uh, our soldiers are the strength of our army. And all of their families are the strength of our soldiers. And likewise, my family has been my strength uh, throughout my life. Uh, both my mother and father served our nation in World War II as part of the greatest generation, with my mother attending the medical needs of soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines from the Pacific at a military hospital near Seattle, Washington, while my father served with the 4th Marine Division in the Central Pacific, making the assault landings in Kwajalein, Saipan, Tinian, and the bloody Battle of Iwo Jima as a young 19 and 20-year-old. Sadly, my mother passed over 20 years ago, and my father passed 
just last April, a week shy of his 91st birthday. But I am absolutely sure that they are both very proud of, from above for their soldier's son and will always be a source of leadership and guidance for me in the years ahead. I'm also unbelievably lucky to have by my side, as I previously introduced, for the last 30 consecutive years of my service, the most dedicated and strongest woman in the world, my wife, Holly Ann. She, like my parents, is a constant source of inspiration and love. For many years, during seven contingency deployments on various operations and thousands of days of training, Holly Ann has essentially been like so many Army spouses, a single parent who has raised two wonderful children who are now young adults, our daughter Mary Margaret and our son Peter, who unfortunately could not be with us today. But it is for them and for all of our children and the future generations that I and all of us in uniform continue to serve and are willing to go in harm's way to give our todays for their tomorrows. And I'd like to just take a moment and recognize Holly Ann as a representative of all the Army families, of all the Army spouses, and for their incredible resilience, service, and sacrifice. I'd also like to congratulate my predecessor, General Ray Odinero, and his wife, Linda, who have given over 39 consecutive years of distinguished service to our great nation. I want to personally thank them both for their tremendous leadership as our current Chief of Staff and leading spouse. Our nation has been well served by this selfless soldier and his entire family. Chairman, Senators, service in the United States Army is a privilege. It's a distinct privilege. It's not a right. It's a privilege and it's earned the old-fashioned way through hard work and meeting exacting standards of discipline and excellence. In your Army's contract with the American people is a combat-ready force built around our nation's most valuable asset, our sons and daughters who become soldiers of character in the best trained and best equipped Army in the world. And our fundamental task is like no other. It is to win, and to win in the unforgiving crucible of ground combat. There are many other tasks and roles and missions that your Army can do as part of our joint force, and we perform those every day in support of our nation's interest. We assure allies, we deter adversaries, we shape outcomes and build partner capacity. We provide foundational capabilities to enable other joint forces in a variety of ways. We provided needed help to victims of disaster. But our reason for being, our very reason for being at the very core of what it means to have an army, it's to win and to win decisively in ground combat against the enemies of our country so that American citizens can enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And every year, 120,000 of America's sons and daughters raise their right hand to take an oath of allegiance to serve our nation in the uniform of your United States Army. And in return, we make the commitment to develop them as soldiers, as leaders, and importantly, as citizens. These soldiers are the core of our all-volunteer Army made up of three components, the active, the National Guard, and the Reserve. We are a total army. We are, in fact, one army. We're America's army. And all of us, from private to general, come from the people. And we are dedicated to give our life and our limb to serve the people. And we do it with great pride in a cause that transcends ourselves. I have huge confidence in our army today. I have served in it in both peace and war. And right now, we have the most skilled and combat experienced army in the nation's history. But in this time of increasing instability, of increasing uncertainty throughout the globe, we must squarely face and solve significant challenges, as Chairman, you mentioned, in manpower, readiness, and modernization. If confirmed as the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, I look forward to working with this committee to get the Army the resources it needs, and I also pledge to be a careful steward on behalf of the American taxpayer, whom we recognize we all serve as well. And finally, if confirmed as Chief of Staff of the Army, I will ensure that the Army meets the expectations of the American people. The American people have expected your Army to fight and win 
our nation's wars at any time, any place, and your soldiers are ready to do that today, as we have done for 240 consecutive years. Today, we have a great army, and we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. It will be a tremendous honor to lead our soldiers of today as their chief of staff, and I thank each of you, without whom we would not even have an army. I thank you for the opportunity to appear here today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General, and thank you for your strong statement. Uh, as you know, last week uh, there were four unarmed Marines and one sailor in Chattanooga, Tennessee, were uh, murdered. Uh, what steps do you believe should be put in place immediately to improve the security of Army personnel in the United States, especially at facilities like recruiting stations? Uh, Senator, first, uh, as a son of someone who served in the 4th Marine Division, I want to publicly extend my condolences to the families of the four Marines and one sailor who were killed, and uh, it's a horrible tragedy. Uh, force protection is a, is a key task for any commander. Uh, as it is uh, for all of the leaders in the Army and throughout the military. Uh, specifically, uh, there's a wide variety of both active and passive measures. Uh, as you uh, may know, uh, Admiral Gordon, Commander Northcom, issued out some increased force protection measures, which uh, I won't discuss publicly exactly what those are. But from my view, there's a variety of both active and passive. From a passive standpoint, there's a variety of hardening things we can do, bulletproof glass, etc. cetera. Uh, actively, we can increase patrols, uh, work closely with the law enforcement. As far as arming recruiters go, uh, I think that's uh, complicated uh, legally, uh, and there's issues involved uh, throughout um, the country, but we'll have to come to grips with that, and it if, certainly uh, should be some The legal considered. part of it can be resolved. Do you think that they should, under certain conditions, be, be armed? I think under certain conditions, uh, both on military bases uh, and in outstations, recruiting states, reserve centers, uh, that we should seriously consider it. In some cases, I think it's appropriate. As regards uh, Afghanistan, should we withdraw according to a preordained calendar-based plan or a condition-based plan? Uh, I'm in favor of a condition-based plan. Which, right now, would you say that um, the situation would warrant uh, uh, evaluation and revision of the President's plan to, by 2017 to have an embassy-based force? Um, right now, I think the... Uh, Talking with John Campbell, General Campbell, the commander uh, of uh, the force in Afghanistan, it's my understanding that uh, the plan is continually under reviewed and, and, that, uh, and that we will execute based on conditions on the ground. But that is your view. Um, General Dunford testified before this committee that even with the $38 billion addition that the our nation's military, quote, would remain at the lower ragged edge of manageable risk in our ability to execute the defense strategy. Do you agree with that? I do with respect to the Army as we uh, look out, uh, and I concur with General Odinero's uh, assessment. That we would be at the lower ragged edge? Um, I'd probably agree with that, yes, uh, Senator. And then uh, I think he testified to significant risk. Uh, and if we go to 420, as Senator Reid mentioned earlier, we'd be shifting into high risk. Do you believe that we should arm the Ukrainians with counter-battery systems with which to defend themselves from Russian artillery and rocket strikes? Uh, Senator, I think uh, providing non-lethal uh, equipment is uh, already being done, and I think lethal I'm equipment... i about lethal equipment. Yeah, lethal equipment, I think, something we should consider, and I would be in favor of lethal defensive equipment. Um, do we, in your view, do we have a strategy to defeat ISIS? Uh, Senator, there is a strategy. It's, uh, I think you're familiar with there's nine lines of effort. The military's got two, um, and currently there is a strategy. And that strategy is also applies to Syria? Um, Syria is part of the overall strategy with respect to ISIS, as I understand it. S so you believe that we do have a strategy to defeat ISIS? Uh, I think the, there is a strategy, yes. Do you think it will defeat ISIS? I think currently, uh, it, right now, the way the strategy is laid out, as I understand it, um, is that uh, it is going to take a considerable amount of time, uh, measured in years, uh, to defeat ISIS if we execute the strategy as it's currently designed. Maybe you could tell me a little bit about that strategy, because the President said they have not developed it yet. Um, there's, 
as I understand it, there's nine lines of effort. Um, the two that concern the military uh, are providing um, a variety of enabler capabilities to the Iraqi military uh, and also to uh, provide security force assistance uh, and building partner capacity with the Iraqi military. In your experience, do you believe that we need forward air controllers? In my experience, having forward air controllers forward with units provides uh, more effective close air support. Well, I thank you, General, and uh, thank you for your service, and we look forward to moving forward with your nomination, and uh, congratulations, and I, all of us would also agree that your predecessor was also an outstanding soldier. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you, General Miley, for, um, uh, for your uh, no way for your testimony. I get confused because up, up our way, it's usually Miley. I don't know what happened, but anyway. That's in Rhode Island. So I, know. <laughs> I know. You're from Massachusetts. I know. <laughs> so. For, so forgive me if I uh, mispronounce things. Um, from as long as we both like the Red Sox, we're good. We like the Red Sox and, and, and the Bruins. Uh, yeah, no, I, we, we're at a, uh, I, well, I'll stop right there and ask a serious question, Judge General. Uh, you're facing uh, force reductions, 450,000 active forces, uh, which leads to the question, uh, how do you ensure that you can meet all the requirements that are facing uh, the, the Army? And several possibilities, and you can comment on them, is a much smoother, uh, closer integration with National Guard and Reserve Forces so they can come into the fight earlier. That's one. Two, uh, obviously continuing to operate jointly and train jointly with the Marine Corps, uh, which is a way to augment land forces. And three, uh, to continue or to increase, in fact, during operations with foreign militaries that are our allies. So could you comment on those approaches, and will that in any way help sort of offset the decline in re, uh, manpower? Well, first, Senator, I, I think that the reduction in manpower down to 450,000 for the active force, 920 or, or 980 overall uh, for the uh, total force, uh, I th and I agree with uh, the current Chief of Staff's assessment that places the nation uh, at significant risk, uh, given our global commitments. Uh, in order to mitigate that risk, uh, incorporating uh, elements of the National Guard and Reserve component are key, uh, and then working with allies is fundamental. Uh, I think all of those are, are necessary to mitigate some of the risk. Uh, specific with respect to the National Guard, w what is your approach? To, uh, you know, we speak of one army, and frank frankly, it, looking back 30 or more years, it is now much more one army than it was previously. What are you going to do to make sure that that's that more than rhetoric, that that, that really is their one consistent army, National Guard Reserve Active Force? Well, we're already doing many things. As a commander of forces command, I've got uh, training readiness oversight for the Guard and, and uh, actual command of the uh, reserves. There's many things we're doing right now. Uh, we integrate uh, at both of our combat training centers uh, down at Fort Polk, Louisiana, and out in California, National Training Center. We are fully integrated uh, with the uh, reserve component and National Guard elements. So integration of those forces is key, and we'll sustain that and in increase that over time. Uh, second big one, I think, is we uh, have partnerships. Uh, all of our active component forces are partnered with National Guard units, uh, and they are fully integrated uh, for home station training and support each other. Uh, one of the areas of concern, and this has been led by Senator McCain's efforts over many years, has been acquisition reform. And he, frankly, uh, indicated a long litany of uh, major systems where the Army couldn't get off the drawing board, literally. Uh, there are proposals today to involve the Chiefs more directly and not only with, uh, with authority but responsibility. Can you comment about the acquisition process uh, and what you would like to do as if service chief in making it more effective? Uh, thanks, Senator. The, in my view, I think the service chief should have an increased role uh, across the entire acquisition process, where uh, we are responsible for and held accountable for uh, linking the requirements, which we do play, the service chiefs play a role in that right now. Uh, but we are not, or the service chiefs are not as engaged as uh, could be. Uh, with respect uh, to the resources and decisions of ac actual acquisition. So those three pieces linking uh, resources, the requirements, and the actual acquisition 
In my view, the chief should have increased authority to link all three of those throughout the entire process. So not just the inputs of requirement, but also the outputs of acquisition. Just a final point very quickly is that, you know, that we've uh, consistently pointed out that uh, readiness is being challenged in terms of uh, brigades when 30 percent of Army brigades are ready to go and that's way below. Uh, that requires some either massive budget relief or internal reallocation of resources. Uh, so what do you, if you don't get the budget relief, what kind of resources are you prepared to reallocate to get training done? There really is three pieces, uh, three levers that any chief of staff uh, uh, can use. Uh, one is end strength, uh, the other is modernization, and the other is readiness. Uh, our obligation uh, as an Army or any service uh, is to ensure that we have ready forces. Uh, there's no soldier, sailor, airman, or Marine who should ever go into harm's way uh, not fully manned, equipped, well-led, et cetera. Uh, so no one should ever go in harm's way unready. So readiness is the number one priority. Uh, it's my number one priority if confirmed, and it will remain the number one priority. Uh, so that leaves only end strength and modernization. Uh, right now, the Army has taken a lot of cuts uh, in modernization over time, uh, and, uh, and then we have end strength. So if confirmed, I'm going to have to take a hard look to make sure that we balance those three components uh, as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General, for being here today. When we met uh, earlier this month, you mentioned uh, two of your priorities. And as you just said, it, the first one was readiness, and you also said investing in future needs. Do you believe that uh, the future needs will require the Army to primarily focus on modernizing its current capabilities, or do you see a a shift to new missions and new capabilities. And I know there's been a lot of talk about the uh, Army's role in coast, coastal defense. So where, where do you see that headed? Thanks, Senator. The, uh, as you said, two priorities exist for uh, any chief of staff, really. Uh, one is maintain readiness of the force. Uh, second is to posture the force uh, to be ready at some point in the future. Uh, the, the period of time that I'd be looking at in the future if I were confirmed would be the 2025, 2030, 2035 uh, time frame. Uh, right now, our modernization strategy is to incrementally improve existing systems. And that's okay for right now. Uh, but there are a wide variety of emerging technologies uh, that we may or may not have military application 15 to 20 years from now. Uh, we're going to take a look at those. We're going to explore all of those. Uh, ask the right questions and to see which ones of those uh, apply to ground forces. Many already apply to air and naval forces. Uh, so emerging technology is an area we're going to take a hard look at, Senator. Do you see a shift, though, to any um, new missions that are going to be um, necessary for the Army to um, acquire? I think the fundamental missions that uh, currently exist in the variety of strategic documents that are out there uh, will remain consistent, uh, and I do not see a fundamental shift in the mission for the Army. Okay. Even with the advancement of new technologies um, by uh, people who are not our friends, do you see the Army playing any role in that on new missions? Um, the only one I'm, um, that's coming to mind right now is cyber. Uh, we definitely have uh, increased uh, our capabilities in cyber across the joint force, uh, and the Army is building a cyber force, so we're going to continue to look at that because that's critical for uh, the defense of the nation and for the Army's capabilities. Okay. And as the current commander of the Army Forces Command, I know that you're responsible for providing uh, Army units so you can fulfill the combatant commander's requirements. We uh, heard a little bit about the force reduction and um, the impact that that may have. Right now, are you able to uh, fulfill the combatant commander's requirements, and where will um, where will it be when we look at a force that's reduced to 450,000? Uh, as Commander Force come right now, we are able, to, uh, Senator, to uh, fulfill the combatant commander's request for forces uh, that have come in. Um, as we continue to draw down to 450,000 by 2017, 2018, uh, I think we are going to incur uh, increased risk, as uh, current chief has mentioned, and it'll approach. It'll be at the end of it, it'll be significant risk. Uh, we'll have to see. We don't know what the uh, future requirements are going to be. 
uh, Senator McCain mentioned, uh, you've got issues in Eastern Europe, you've got issues uh, with ISIS, uh, and there's a wide variety of other security challenges around the world. So if demand continues to increase at its, uh, that it has in the last year, unanticipated demand, then I think uh, we'll have to conduct, reassess our risk assessment. And SOCOM is one of the combatant commands that you support as well. And I've been concerned that reductions across the services are going to impact the conventional force enablers that our special ops guys rely upon. Uh, how do you work with them to manage that collateral damage that reductions are going to have on their capabilities? Uh, we're very, very closely tied, as you might imagine, with Special Operations Command. Eighty percent of U.S. Special Operations comes from the Army. Um, so we're very closely tied at Fort Bragg. Forcecom headquarters is also the headquarters for U.S. Army Special Operations Command. So we're joined at the hip. And uh, one of the big lessons learned that's come out of the last 10 to 15 years of, of conflict uh, has been the synergistic effect that we've gotten from the uh, interdependence of both conventional and special operations. So we'll continue to work with them uh, very, very closely. Uh, we have uh, them integrated in all of our major exercises at the combat training centers. Uh, we work with them on acquisition and development, and obviously we provide a wide variety of enablers that uh, support special operations. We'll, we'll keep that linkage. That won't break. Thank you, sir. I, I appreciate your commitment to making sure that our, our military men and women are able to perform the missions that they are given. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General. And I want to thank you for your service to our country and to your family support of that service you've given us. Uh, sir, you and I have had a good conversation on quite a few things, and I'll ask you the same question I've asked most of our uh, conferees. What do you consider the greatest threat the United States of America faces? Uh, as a soldier, as a... National security for our a, country. A, a, as a soldier, as a, as a military officer, uh, I'd have to say that it, it's Russia, and let me explain that and why. Uh, Russia is the only country on Earth uh, that retains a nuclear capability uh, to destroy the United States. So it's an existential threat to the United States. So it has capability. Uh, intent, don't know. but. The activity of Russia since 2008 has been very, very aggressive. Uh, they've attacked and invaded Georgia. Uh, they've seized the Crimea. Uh, they have attacked uh, into the Ukraine. That's worrisome. Uh, so I would put Russia right now from a military perspective as the number one threat. I would also add uh, China, North Korea, uh, and ISIS, uh, along with Iran, just uh, including the you know, recent agreement that was uh, signed the other day. Those countries, I wouldn't put them in any particular order. Uh, each in their own different way represent uh, threats, security threats uh, to the United States. Also, we talked about um, uh, the obstacles that you're facing or that, uh, that we are facing by using the National Guard to the full extent, especially the day-to-day -day operations. If you could expand on that, what are the obstacles that prevents the Army from using this Army National Guard uh, to the extent that they should be as well trained as they are today? Uh, as you know, Senator, the, the National Guard has been uh, key over the last uh, decade and a half uh, and have served uh, very proudly and honorably uh, in both Afghanistan and Iraq, and they're fully integrated in a lot of uh, our training operations here in the continental United States. Uh, it would help if we had greater access uh, to the Guard. Uh, right now, um, we have the Guard has state partnership programs overseas with a wide variety of countries. Uh, there's a lot of exercises in support of combatant commanders that we could use Guard forces for. And there's operations, current operations. Uh, some are peacekeeping, peace enforcement, such as Kosovo and, and the Sinai. Others are more active in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Uh, but fundamentally, access to the Guard uh, is key, and that all links back to the budget. Uh, right now, we can only pay for bringing an active duty or bringing uh, guard units, mobilizing and bringing them on uh, under OCO funding. Uh, and many of these operations are, in fact, exercises for the COCOMs, and they're not covered with OCO funding. So right. access and funding. I would sure look forward to working with you on making that available, because I think our guard could be used more effectively than what they are right now, other than private contractors uh, that we're using. And that would bring me right up to the auditing. Uh, what's your understanding of where the Army stands in terms of being ready for a full audit by the end of fiscal year 17? Uh, I've been briefed that uh, both as the force con commander, but also uh, through the pre-confirmation hearing preparation briefings I've gotten from the Army staff, that the Army is on track and uh, will be ready to, for the full 
auditing in 2017? Um, if confirmed, will you make proving the Army's acquisition system a priority? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think you would understand the concerns that we have with the procurement system that we have right now. And uh, it doesn't seem to work very functionally as far as uh, effective or uh, cost effective, especially. Uh, and changing those systems, uh, again, it all ties back to the auditing as quickly as that can be done. And also, do you have any idea on the amount of contractors that we have or the Army's using contract forces? I don't know right this minute, Army wide. I do know, for example, I recently commanded in Afghanistan, and there were 1.5, one and a half contractors to every soldier that was deployed over there. So uh, the amount of contractors we use is significant, and I can get you the exact number. If you could, sir, I'd appreciate that, because I think the cost of the contractors versus using our own National Guard and reserves uh, it makes more sense to use, to, in my estimation, people in uniform versus people that basically have been in uniform and left for the higher pay and the contractors are receiving, and that's the, that's the rub I've had all along. So if you could help me with that, I'd appreciate it. Absolutely. We'll do that. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, General. And I want to thank your family for their service as well to our nation. I wanted to follow up. Uh, you, you confirmed today what General Dumford had also testified to this committee before, uh, that Russia is our greatest national security threat. And um, I noticed also in your advanced policy questions that you stated unambiguously that the Army in Europe does not have what it needs. What does UCOM need that it does not have, and how important is this as we think about Russia as uh, the most significant threat that we're facing? I think there's two parts to that. One is to assure allies, and the other is to deter uh, Russian aggression. Uh, and I think in both cases, uh, additional ground capabilities in, uh, are, are necessary. Uh, the Army's already moving out on that to place activity sets over there uh, and prepositioned equipment. Uh, to either reinforce capabilities that are there, forces that are there, uh, or to use that equipment for a variety of exercises. There's a lot of tools in the kit bag we can use, uh, but I do think we need to increase ground forces uh, on a temporary rotational basis uh, in order to either deter Russia uh, or assure our allies. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to follow up. You had, in answer to Senator Manchin, had talked about access to the Guard. And one of the things that we've seen um, is a program with the Air Force that's called Total Force Enterprise Active Associate uh, Unit. So in other words, it's total force. So at Pease uh, in New Hampshire, we've had an active duty association between active duty Air Force um, and our guard there that's been really effective. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you if that's something that you would take a look at as uh, actually actively partnering certain units uh, together to have these active duty associations, because I think this model, uh, the Air Force has had some good success with it and recognizes as well, as you've already uh, indicated today, I mean, we would not have been able to fight uh, the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan without the Guard and Reserve, and, and being able to actually do some training and work together um, with certain units, I think, makes some sense. I wanted to get your thought on that, and if that's something you would look at as a, a possibility? Uh, it is, Senator. In fact, I've met with your tag from New Hampshire, uh, along with all the other tags east of Mississippi, uh, about, I guess it was six, eight weeks ago. Uh, they brought that up. So I'm going to try to take a look at that and see where it applies to the Army, uh, if that Air Force model can, uh, can apply for greater and fuller integration. Uh, as you know, the Guard and Reserve uh, were integrated under General Abrams when he was Chief of Staff right following Vietnam. Uh, and the Abrams Doctrine has served the nation well. Uh, and we intend to fully implement that. Well, certainly it's a total force uh, needs in terms of what we need to do to defend the nation. So I appreciate your careful examination of that uh, program, which has been very successful at PEAS. I wanted to also follow up, um, General, how important is effective and reliable air missile defense to Army operations? Uh, because uh, one thing that's been brought to my attention as uh, we we have the Patriot, 13 ally of our allies also rely on the Patriot to protect their forces. And uh, yet some of our allies have more modern and advanced versions of the Patriot than our troops have. Uh, so 
I, I don't agree with that. And I think this committee very clearly in the defense authorization, actually the Army requested $106 million for Patriot improvement to uh, upgrade um, our use of the Patriot. And that was actually accepted by this committee. Um, so I wanted to get your sense uh, based on your service in the Army. Uh, what is your assessment of the Patriot Air Missile and Defense System? And do you fully support uh, our, the improvement funding that the Army requested for this? And how important is this to our troops? Well, Senator, let me take the last part first, how important it is. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm not a military historian, but I don't think the United States Army has come under enemy air attack consecutively, uh, consistently since the invasion of Normandy. Uh, and that's because of two things. One, we have the most dominant air force, both naval aviators and United States Air Force uh, pilots and capabilities. And we want to retain that forever. Uh, and the other piece is because we have a very robust air defense capability that's uh, capable of shooting down incoming aircraft. Uh, since the modern development of, uh, of, of uh, missile technology, that's another component. We have come under uh, missile threat. Uh, we were under missile threat in the first Gulf War and, and even in the second Gulf War. Uh, Patriot plays a key role uh, in not only acquiring and then destroying incoming fixed-wing aircraft, uh, but also in intercepting and destroying incoming missiles. So Patriot is a very, very key system to the air defense of our uh, allies and our own soldiers on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, General, to you and your family for your service. I appreciated the great conversation we had last week, and uh, should, we, should you be confirmed, uh, I look forward to, of course, working with you during your tenure. I uh, know that you realize, General, the, the uh, importance of MILCOM funding for readiness, particularly for Hawaii in light of the rebalance to the Asia Pacific. And in fact, I spent some four hours at Schofield Barracks recently and saw the direct effect on facilities there uh, when MILCOM funding is cut or deferred. So should you be confirmed, I hope you will work with USERPAC to ensure that their facilities are maintained and modernized where appropriate so that our troops have the facilities necessary to efficiently perform the important tasks we ask of them. I will certainly do that, Senator. Thank you. I also know that you share my view that the rebalance to the Asia Pacific is more than just rhetoric. Uh, the, the Navy's intentions, uh, for example, are to place 60 percent of its ships in this area of responsibility. What do you see as the major components of our rebalance strategy? Well, I think that uh, right now is I mentioned earlier two of that list of threats uh, that were asked to me of Senator Manchin included both China and, and North Korea. Uh, so the United States Army plays a key role. Uh, eight of the ten uh, largest armies in the world uh, are in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, clearly, Navy and Air Force and Marines are, are fundamental to success for U.S. national security in, uh, in the Pacific, uh, but the Army is too. Uh, and we currently have forward deployed forces in Korea that have significant or made a significant contribution to keeping the peace for the last 60 years since the end of the Korean War. Uh, we also have forces, as you are well aware, in Alaska at, at Fort Lewis, Joint Base Lewis McCord at, in Washington State, uh, and uh, most importantly in, in, this, in the state of Hawaii. Uh, so there's a considerable amount of Army capabilities in the Pacific that play a key role uh, in supporting Admiral Harris as, as the combatant commander and supporting Admiral Harris's uh, PACOM strategy. Well, we, we recognize that uh, because of the budget issues that, that certain um, force reductions were inevitable, sad to say. Um, and of course, while unfortunate, I do appreciate the consideration that was given to the rebalance to the Asia Pacific and Hawaii's strategic location and the decisions that were made regarding um, the cuts to our army. Uh, can I expect that if conf confirmed, you will continue to give ample consideration to our strategic position, and that, of course, includes Alaska, and to the importance of the rebalance? Absolutely, Senator. Uh, as, uh, as we go forward, uh, balancing the disposition of the Army forces uh, in accordance with the national strategy and balancing that against risk is, is a key, key task for the Chief of Staff, and I will take that. 
This committee has spent considerable time on the issue of the sexual assault in the military. And that it still, of course, occurs and harassment persists in our military. And from your testimony and our meeting, I know you find it uh, totally unacceptable as well. However, while efforts are being made to support and encourage victims to come forward, we are becoming more aware of the problem of retaliation. Uh, can you share with us some of your specific plans to reduce not only sexual assault, but also to stop the further abuse by retaliation? Well, Senator, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, sexual assault's just, there's, there's no place for it uh, at all in, in a disciplined uh, military force. Uh, you know, two years ago, uh, there were, I think it was 24,000 reports of, of sexual assault. That's an Army Corps. Yeah. Uh, it's wrong. It's, it's just not acceptable, and we can't accept those kind of casualties. Really, that's what they are. Victims become casualties. Uh, we can't accept a Corps' worth of casualties and think we're going to have a ready Army that can deal with the threats that were mentioned earlier. Uh, so it's unacceptable. Uh, the Army has done a lot uh, over the last uh, many years here, uh, and there's been some progress, but it's not nearly enough, and I'm fully committed, if confirmed as Chief of Staff, uh, to continue to work the entire problem of sexual assault and bring that to zero. Um, retaliation is, is uh, a problem that's recently surfaced in the last uh, year or so. I saw the recent study which indicated that 60 percent uh, of victims report that they've been retaliated against, some by chain of command, others by peers. Mm -hmm. um, I think that by chain of command retaliation, uh, we can get after that pretty fast uh, through a variety of tools uh, and holding commanders accountable. Peer-on-peer uh, -peer is a little bit more complex, and I'm going to have to study that uh, to figure out exactly what techniques can be used to eliminate peer-on-peer -peer retaliation. Thank you. This will be an ongoing um, area of concern for many of us on this committee, so thank you for whatever you can do to improve the situation vastly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, General Milley. It's great to have you in front of in front of the committee today. I want to thank your your wife for being here as well. Thank you for for su the support that you've given over 34 years um, or 30 years for your husband. So, thank you. I won't ask about the National Guard. Um, we have had some very in-depth discussions in my office, and I thank you for your willingness to work with our uh, wonderful National Guard and all of those great young men and women that that provide a great support system to our active component members. So thank you for that. I uh, just wanted to mention we do have, you mentioned the ties between our active component and the Guard, and we do have our second BCT from Iowa, the Iowa Army National Guard, rotating through JRTC right now. So we do appreciate that partnership. Um, I want to tag on with a little bit on what Senator Hirono had also brought up was the cases of sexual assault in the military. I was at the West Point Board of Visitors meeting yesterday, and this is a topic that, that we discussed. And you have over 34 years of experience in the Army, and so you've seen a lot of changes through the years. And so when it comes to uh, sexual assault, uh, in the way the, the Army reports this, prosecutes this, uh, we have seen some changes in recent years. And I would like your takeaway from what we've seen just in the last few years and uh, with those changes, what do you see? Is it improving um, the areas where you think we've seen the most impact? Um, if you could just expound on that a little bit, please. Thanks, sir. Uh, there has been uh, as I mentioned, there has been some improvement. Uh, it, it's not good enough, though, uh, but there has been some improvement uh, over the last uh, couple of years. We, we know that uh, the prevalence of incidents uh, appears to be down, and then in the uh, numbers of reporting uh, is up. So it indicates some shift in trust to the chain of command. Uh, but I think the key uh, is uh, to prevent uh, and or intervene uh, up front. Uh, and that comes with a change of culture uh, and fully educating the force, a uh, wide variety of uh, training. If an incident does occur, though, uh, the first responsibility for that chain of command is to protect that victim uh, and then uh, investigate fully with professional investigators, CID investigators, mm -hmm. uh, and then hold those perpetrators accountable. I think the entire key is within the hands of the chain of command. Uh, and that's. Uh, that's staff sergeants and platoon sergeants up through first sergeants and company commanders, all the way up through general officers. 
All of us have to be fully engaged uh, in order to uh, get after that. A couple of things over 35 years that I've uh, used and seen and have emphasized. One is the role of the commander, absolutely fundamental. An engaged commander makes the difference between success and, and, and lack of success. Uh, secondly, uh, I would say is uh, operate in buddy teams. Uh, there's, there's great value in operating in, in uh, using buddy team approaches like you would in combat. Uh, third is control of the terrain, which is the barracks. We can't necessarily control outside the forts, but we surely as commanders can control the barracks. Uh, and maintaining good order and discipline is fundamental uh, to those, uh, to, the, uh, to the barracks. And lastly is alcohol. Uh, we know uh, that in many, many cases of sexual assault, alcohol is a contributing factor. Mm -hmm. uh, so maintaining good order and discipline, again, in the proper use of alcohol is fundamental. Uh, but I think commanders in the chain of command, the sergeants and the captains and the colonels and the generals, are fundamental uh, to uh, getting after sexual assault and bringing it to an end to an, in our army. I appreciate that very much, um, and I do uh, see where we seem to have a lower level of incidents. We have a very, very long way to go with this. Uh, one of the points that we raised yesterday at West Point with the Board of Visitors is that it's really difficult when you have someone like yourself or, or even me with a lot of gray hair uh, standing there telling these young soldiers, don't do this, don't do this. I think where we can see a lot of shift in the culture and the environment is when their peers are stepping up and saying, don't do it. Um, we've talked about not in my squad. I think that's an important step. Um, we have a long ways to go, General. I look forward to working with you on this very important topic and protecting our sons and daughters as they serve. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Milley, first I want to commend you on your statement. I think it's one of the best statements I've ever heard about the role and mission of the Army. It should be required reading, I think, for every member of the Army today. Uh, one of the questions you asked, uh, you answered to the Chairman was that would you commit to provide your personal views even if those views differ from the administration in power? You said yes to that question. I want to underline the importance of that question. All of your experience, all of your knowledge, all of your uh, wisdom that you've accumulated over the years are of no value if you don't share them. And you're operating in the, you will be operating in the highest levels of our government in a situation that often can be intimidating. And I want to encourage you to remember that question and when in doubt, speak up. You're where you are because of your knowledge and experience and uh, you have to share it and uh, sometimes share it uh, aggressively. I hope you will uh, remember that question and remember the commitment you made. I think, I think you have a great deal to offer this country and I just want to be sure it gets to the table. Uh, Senator, I guarantee that. I've been in a lot of combat and I'll be intimidated by no one. I, uh, I, I believe I, uh, I believe that, uh, having met you, General. Uh, more specific question. Are the Iraqi security forces willing to fight? When we left in 2011, uh, the reports, uh, I wasn't there in 2011, but was there shortly before that, and Iraqi security forces were willing to fight. Um, but in the years between 2011 and today, uh, their chains of command have been decimated and they weren't getting proper pay and training went down the tubes. Uh, so bottom line is if three or four years go by and you lack training, you lack money, you lack equipment, you lack spare parts, and most importantly, you lack a competent, capable, committed leadership, uh, then you can certainly understand why units fell apart uh, last year during the ISIS offensive. Uh, so uh, I think there's nothing inherently prohibiting the Iraqi security forces from a will to fight with the exception of a lack of proper leadership. Uh, and that's fundamental from where I sit, and I would like to get a trip over there and talk to our commanders on the ground, talk to General Austin, talk to General Clark and others. Uh, but my assessment is they have the potential and the capability uh, to fight, uh, but they must be led, just like any army must be led, uh, to uh, close with and destroy the enemies of their country. It seems to me that when we think about the, the strategic challenges of Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, the Ukraine, all of those are local troops with U.S. support in one way or another. And one of the key challenges, how do you teach the will to fight? How do you train? Have we, have we learned that? Are we 
at a place where we know what the pressure points are to develop, for example, the, the command mentality that's necessary because we're, we're in a series of disputes around the world, none of which involve directly many, if any, U.S. troops. So we're at the mercy of how these local people perform. And I'm, I'm wondering about the Army's sort of thinking about how to do training. That may be one of the most essential uh, tasks that the new Army has. Uh, we, we in the Army think that we do know how to develop leaders. Uh, if there's, uh, the, the Army does many, many things and does many things well, uh, but we definitely produce lots of good leaders uh, in, uh, in throughout our force on a day-to-day -day basis. We know also how to do that uh, with other armies, with, other, with foreign armies, uh, specifically, as you mentioned, both Afghanistan and Iraq, we think we can do that. Uh, how do you do that? Um, leaders have to have confidence in their, in their personal skills and their competence. Uh, that's fundamental. No soldier is going to follow a leader who's constantly lost, who's incompetent, who's a, who's a cement head out there and doesn't know how to uh, shoot, move, communicate, and bring fire on the enemy. No, no soldier is ever going to follow that, so, that leader. So competence is key in teaching them the skills the military skills necessary at the level they're at. Uh, the other piece is the, the leader has to demonstrate compassion and love for their soldiers. Uh, if they see a leader who does not actually care for them, they're not going to uh, follow them. And, la and the third piece, I think, is a committed leader, a leader to, who's committed to the cause for which they fight. Uh, if those three elements are combined together uh, in Iraqi leadership at the small unit tactical level and at the strategic level, uh, then I think the Iraqi security forces uh, have a good chance of prevailing. A year or so ago, Senator Kane and I were in Lebanon, and we saw the training program that involves bringing uh, foreign officers to the U.S. and also providing the kind of training that you're talking about. That struck us as a very cost-effective uh, uh, technique, particularly bringing them here, because they see, they, they get a lot from their peers when they're at Fort Benning or at Fort Hood or, or wherever they are. Uh, is that a program that you think should be uh, continued, strengthened, emphasized? Yes, I do, Senator, absolutely. Uh, it's, it's been valuable in the past over many, many decades uh, with many armies around the world. And uh, doing foreign military exchange in our education system is uh, value added for foreign armies. I'm a little bit over time, but a, ver a very short question. How long would it take us to go from a 450 back up to, say, 550 if, uh, God forbid, circumstances required it? Uh, what, I'd have to what's take, the lead time? Yeah, I'd have to take, the, take that one for the record for the analysis and uh, get back in, like, an opportunity to study that. But to, to build a brigade, for example, a brigade combat team, call it uh, 3,500, 4,000 soldiers, depends on the type of brigade you have. Uh, to build that from scratch is about a three-year period, a three- or four-year period to really get them certified and ready to engage in ground combat operations. So uh, to regenerate that force from 450 to 550, uh, it can be done, but it's not going to be done uh, in a very, very short amount of time. Thank you. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, thank you for uh, your testimony, and thank you for coming by to, to see uh, many of us before the testimony. I want to ask you about the National Commission on the Future of the Army, which was established by the National Defense Authorization Act of, of uh, 2015 and the Army's Aviation Restructure Initiative, or ARI. Uh, the National Commission's mandate is to evaluate future missions, evaluate the force mix of the total Army, and evaluate whether combat aviation assets from the Army National Guard should be transferred to the Army. I understand from sources within the Pentagon that the Army intends to implement certain elements of the Army's ARI as early as October 1st of this year. Um, as I expressed to you, making these irreversible force structure changes to the Guard before we've had a chance to see what the Commission has to say about ARI uh, would not be advisable and does not make sense to me. The intent of Congress was clear. There should be no transfers of helicopters away from the Guard until Congress receives and reviews the findings of the Army Commission. As such, I'd like to know your opinion of the ARI plan, which would remove all combat aviation from the Air Army National Guard. Do you support halting transfers of helicopters away from the Guard until the Army Commission reports 
back in February of next year. Thanks, Senator. It's my understanding that transfer by October is in accordance with last year's uh, 15 uh, NDAA and the 16 NDAA, the one that's under uh, debate right now is the one that's talking about halting them. So the Army is actually executing their last written order, which was last year's uh, uh, authorization, as I understand it. I'll look into that, though. As far as do I support it or not, uh, this puts and takes to this ARI thing. Uh, I think the National Guard has some good points. The National Guard makes some points that uh, they're concerned that it's a slippery slope and we're going to take combat capabilities away from them and they won't be able to uh, be the strategic and operational uh, reserve. Uh, fair enough. Uh, but there's also key points on the Army side. One, fiscal. Uh, there's a billion dollar a year savings and $12 billion over time. I think that's not insignificant given the current crunch uh, with sequester, et cetera. Uh, and, and most importantly, I think, is a readiness issue. Uh, if we do not execute this ARI, then I think uh, three of the divisions, uh, the 1st Infantry Division, the 10th Mountain Division, 25th Division in Hawaii, are not going to have armed reconnaissance capability. We're going to blind uh, three out of the 10 active duty division commanders uh, with inability to be able to see a battlefield if they were thereby committed. Uh, so on balance, uh, I would favor the transfer. However, uh, I'm going to wait the results of the commission, and I'm going to pay attention to their recommendations very closely, and I'll remain continually engaged with the uh, with the Guard uh, and try to do the right thing for the total Army. Well, I'm glad to know you're going to await the, the findings of the Commission. And, and I would just say to you uh, a couple of things. From my conversations with many of our people in the Guard, they believe that for many of the states, such as Mississippi, uh, our program would be set back for a decade. Uh, it would take us 10 years to get over the loss of, uh, of these Apaches and, uh, and I, I think would do great, great harm to, to what we've had over the past, and that is that the active Army and the National Guard units have operated seamlessly uh, as one team since 9-11, and, uh, and it's, been, uh, it's been good for the country. I think it's unfortunate that policy fights and distrust between the Guard and Active Army have become uh, prevalent over the, the past five years. What's your assessment of the current relationship between the Army and the Army National Guard? And uh, I, will, will you acknowledge that, that the, um, the, the relationship has deteriorated uh, to, to a point where uh, actually it's unseemly? Well, Senator, the, uh, as the Commander of Forces Command, I deal with the National Guard and uh, United States Army Reserve uh, on a frequent basis. Uh, so I'm coming at this from an operational force point of view, from a fielded forces. Uh, I do not see that friction in the fielded forces. Uh, we train together, we operate together, we have partnerships together, uh, and I have commanded National Guard forces in both Iraq and Afghanistan. You don't see that in the field? I don't see that in the field. That's correct. I do you not see, see that in, tension. You see it here in this city, do you not? Well, I don't. So maybe some things happen when people come to D.C. I don't know, but uh, perhaps there's a uh, there's tension. I, I've heard that. <laughs> uh, that as, as I understand, it, there's tension uh, here uh, uh, amongst some of the senior leaders. Uh, I'll work to I'll work uh, along with uh, uh, General Grass and uh, General Cadavy to to work in, to patch up whatever. Uh, issues there are. Uh, from a personal perspective, I think there's one army. That's it. There's one army. Uh, we all wear the same uniform, and it says United States Army on our chest, and that's the way we have to approach it. Uh, the United States Army cannot conduct combat operations in a sustained way overseas without the use of the National Guard and the Reserve. We just can't do it. We can do short-term operations, but sustained ops cannot be done without the Guard and the Reserve. It's one army. They're critical to our success. Well, thank you very much for that. This, uh, this conversation will continue. Uh, we had it uh, privately in my office. Uh, we're, we're discussing it publicly today, and, and I, think, uh, I, I think we can acknowledge that the National Guard is, is a very integral part of what your mission will be, and I, I hope these issues can be resolved in, in a, a mutually satisfactory manner. Thank you very much for your service. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and General. Thank you and your family um, for all you have done for our country. 
And thanks for taking the time to come to my office. And I just wanted to follow up on um, that discussion. Um, in regards to military suicides, um, we talked about the importance of pushing situ situational awareness um, down the chain of command. And, you know, when I met with um, the Israeli Defense Forces, they said what was critical in reducing suicides was pushing it down the chain of command so the squad leader, the platoon leader, who could identify it right on the spot um, could help. I was wondering what your plans are to make sure that at the squad level, the platoon leader, um, the leaders of those squads and platoons are uh, aware of the challenge and are ready to try to help in eliminating it. Thanks, Senator. As, uh, as you know, I've been in command a lot, um, and uh, suicide is a horrible, tragic thing to see in a unit. Um, the effects, obviously, uh, on the family, the unit, et cetera, are, are uh, just like you would have a killed in action uh, in, in combat. Uh, it's terrible. It's horrible. Uh, but I think in terms of uh, how we get after it, situational awareness is key. Uh, because the Army has done a lot over the last couple of years uh, to increase situational awareness of the signs and the symptoms uh, and then the techniques of intervention, uh, our numbers have dropped considerably uh, in suicide. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one point, is to continue sustaining and actually increasing situational awareness. Second. Uh, is to continue to reduce the stigma. Uh, behavior health, mental health, uh, my view is there but for the grace of God go I. The human psyche is a very fragile thing. And any one of us, regardless of how many patches or ranger tabs or anything else anyone has, uh, is not so hard, not so tough, uh, that they can't break under a certain correct combination of stressors and pressures. Uh, and we have to be alert to those signs and symptoms, and we have to reach out and be literally our brother and sister's keeper. Uh, that attitude has to happen throughout the force. Uh, it has happened considerably uh, better than it was in previous years. In the last few years, it's, it's, it's improved significantly, and we are, that is what I think is contributing uh, to the reduction in suicides, is the increasing situational awareness, the reduction of stigma, and then the uh, intervention on the part of junior soldiers at the, at the most junior level. Well, I would encourage you as uh, uh, in your new position to, to really bird dog this and to make sure that the squad leaders and the platoon leaders know, hey, give us a, uh, let us know if you see something going sideways for one of the guys, one of the men or women, let them know there's no stigma and that um, they should get help and I know you'll do that. Um, I wanted to switch to, um, to Iraq. I was there recently, um, met, with, met with your folks, uh, our whole team and it was right before the push into Ramadi and Fallujah began. And the discussion was just as you said, it's a question of leadership, of good leadership for the ISF, the Iraq Security Forces. And so, uh, you know, as opposed to this plan or that plan, I'd love to hear your unvarnished advice on what you think our role should be in helping uh, the ISF, the Iraqi Security Forces, get their leadership back, back, back together? What can we do best to help them do that? Uh, Senator, I'd like also the opportunity to get over and visit and uh, talk to the guys uh, on the ground to, to answer that question in a, in a more informed and holistic sort of way. But uh, based on what I know now and my own experience in both Iraq and Afghanistan, um, there's a wide variety of things we need to and should do uh, to help the Iraqi security forces in our advise and assist uh, levels of effort. Uh, as I understand it, the, the constraint right now is not so much on what we are doing, uh, but on the amount of trainees the Iraqi security forces are providing uh, for our trainers to do. So uh, maintaining a robust train, advise, and assist effort, security force assistance effort with the Iraqi security forces over a considerable length of time is going to go a long way to shoring them up. What Senator McCain mentioned earlier about JTAX forward, I think, is something that should be seriously considered uh, to improve the effectiveness of the enablers, uh, the close air support uh, that is uh, being provided. Uh, I think advisors going forward with units, again, is something that should be seriously considered. However, uh, there are lots of issues with that, with security of our people and, and the risk associated with it, et cetera. Uh, but bottom line is there are things we can do. Uh, I'd like an opportunity, though, Senator, to 
talk that over with commanders on the ground and give you a, a more informed answer at a later date. Great. I'm about out of time. Um, I would just ask you to remember in regards to Iraq, and I know you will, when you said the Army's mission is to win, we have to win there, too, in order to have success in Syria um, and to help the Iraqi uh, forces have that kind of leadership. And the last thing I'll say is our Article 5 responsibilities um, under NATO with Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. Um, in Korea, their motto, as you know, is fight tonight. Um, we have to make sure we have the same kind of readiness in those areas because we have the same obligations to those countries. They have said they would stand with us. We need to do the same for them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Milley and Ms. Milley, congratulations. Thank you for your service. Um, General Milley, I want to start maybe with uh, going back to something that the uh, chairman mentioned in his opening comments. And incidentally, I'm sorry I had to step out. I've got a competing committee meeting over in judiciary that I've got to go back to. But um, and we have sequestration, which I think to a person we all recognize is devastating. We have to get rid of it. It's bad policy. should have never been implemented. Um, what are your thoughts, though, about ways that we can save money in your new position? And I look forward to supporting you in this nomination. But what areas, in your opinion, do we have the opportunity to bend the cost curve or increase productivity? And how would you go about doing that in your new role? I think there's at least three areas uh, that should be seriously considered. Uh, Senator McCain has already referenced them. Uh, one is I think we have to take a hard look at overhead. Um, the uh, Army, but not just the Army, the military across the board, all the services to include Department of Defense, uh, are a very, very large organization with a big bureaucracy with a significant overhead. The second is acquisition. Uh, as already previously mentioned, uh, there's a considerable amount of cost and in many cases waste in the acquisition process. Uh, we need to get that under control. Uh, and the third and final uh, piece that I think is worth taking a look at, uh, there's a wide variety of emerging technologies that could, in the out years, 15, 20 years from now, uh, lend itself uh, to automated processes uh, and reducing either manpower or manpower costs, compensation costs, over time. And those would be three pretty big areas that I'd want to take a look at if confirmed. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Russia creating a looming threat in Europe. We have uh, the Pacific and, and China's uh, expansion, or, or I should say increased activities there. We have the ongoing war in the Middle East the, against the fight against Islamic extremism. General Odierno, I believe, said that a 50 brigade army should be adequate to keep these threats in check. But now we're on a trajectory for about a 33 brigade army. Do you think that, that managing or facing those threats is possible with a 33 Brigade Army? Um, Senator, are, are you talking active brigades or are you talking uh, the total Army brigades? Because right now, total Army, we have 60 brigades today. Uh, we've got 32 in the active component today. Uh, the plan that was announced a week or two ago will take us down to 30 uh, brigades, active component. And we'll lose two out of the uh, other guard. But the bottom line is, it was the 30. That was the active of the 30. The active grade, right? Um, I think, from a total army perspective, we've got adequate capacity, uh, numbers of brigade combat teams, to handle the contingencies that are currently on the books. If we do not drop below uh, the uh, 980 force, uh, we have adequate capacity size. Uh, but that is with significant risk. That risk is incurred in terms of time, uh, the time to the fight, the time to mobilize guard units, the time to get them trained, certified, et cetera, and get them to the fight. Uh, and then it's also significant risk and potential casualties. Uh, and the second piece is the, not just the capacity, but capability, the readiness of the force, uh, how capable it is to handle that type of fight, uh, which is a different fight than what we would have uh, that we've been dealing with for the last decade and a half. So we've got ways to go in terms of improving our readiness with respect to the higher end type of uh, combat operations. Um, General Milley, I just want to uh, 
uh, close by saying I really I look forward to you being in this role. Uh, you were one of the first people to reach out to me back before I was even sworn in to offer uh, information and to help me ramp up. Uh, you were very generous with your time when I spent uh, several days down at uh, Fort Bragg and you've been up here several times. I know you to be a very approachable, direct person. I think you're going to be a great addition as the uh, Chief of Staff. And thanks again to you and your family. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General, thank you. As all of everyone has expressed, we appreciate you coming by our offices and a chance to visit one-on-one, -on -one, and I certainly appreciated that. I, I want to talk about the cuts and sequestration and the issue that we have in front of us in the next 90 to 120 days here in Congress. <clears throat> the, the installation level cuts that the Army announced earlier this month are based, of course, on us shrinking to 450,000 soldiers. As you know um, and have talked about this morning, there's a significant risk that these cuts will not be the last. If Congress doesn't provide some relief from sequester level caps, the Army will be forced to cut an additional 30,000 active duty soldiers. This year, uh, the Republicans are attempting to get around the statutory budget caps by using the Overseas Contingency Operations, or the War Fund, which doesn't have to be paid for. It can, can be put on a credit card. Would you buy back force structure using this War Fund? Uh, Senator, we would prefer, if possible, uh, the budget be in the base. Uh, but as the recipient of the money, uh, we'll take the OCO uh, if, uh, if that is the only mechanism that we can in order to sustain readiness and strength and modernization. Let me ask one that I think is even more difficult, because then it kind of tramps on whether or not the OCO is being used appropriately, because there's also an obligation you have to only use the Overseas Contingency Fund for what it was designed to be, and that is an off-the-budget unpaid for on the credit card to be used in an emergency for the purposes of a contingency operation. That's why it's called the contingency operations. We know in, in your advanced policy question for this hearing, you noted that our technological advantage over current and potential adversaries are at risk. We invested in the base budget in technology and research for decades to get us to the point that we are today where we are the most technologically superior force in the world. If we want the young men and women we will send to war in the future to have the same advantages that the men and women have today with our technological superiority, can you make long-term research and, t and development investments using a fund that was designed only to apply to a contingency? Uh, I'd have to get back to you on the actual legal use of that fund relative to long-term research. Uh, I think the answer would be no. I think OCO funds are specifically targeted to named operations, overseas contingencies operations. Uh, but I would have to get back to you to see if that could be used. I don't think it could, but I'll, I'll check and get back to you, Senator. The frustrating part of this is the only difference between the commitment to put this $40 billion in the budget between my friends and colleagues and 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 us on this side of the aisle is the willingness to acknowledge that we're spending the money, is the willingness to say this belongs in the base budget, let's put it in the base budget, let's not use an artifice, a gimmick, phoniness to pretend that somehow we are not making an investment in the base needs of our military but rather in an overseas contingency operation. And it remains a great frustration to me and one I'm hopeful that we can work out so that we don't go down this path and create this precedent that I think is very dangerous for the long-term stability of our military and your all's abilities to do your jobs in terms of planning and coordinating and having what you need going forward. Uh, I just think it's a very, very irresponsible precedent. Um, on sexual assault, I know several members have talked about it to you already. I do want to mention, I know you're getting after the retaliation. I'll continue to monitor that. But I want to mention briefly at the end of my time the incredible training that's going on at Fort Leonard Wood for the investigators of sexual assault. This is a special 
set of training that must occur, and I would like your commitment. Uh, the Forensic Experimental Trauma Interview is now being trained uh, throughout the military and, frankly, in the civilian world. The expertise that's been developed at the fort on this is um, unparalleled in terms of how you get after a sexual assault investigation, particularly interviewing a victim. Um, I would like uh, your commitment to familiarize yourself with that training and a commitment that you will continue to fight for the adequate funding so we can actually get these perpetrators behind bars so they are not, in fact, to be smirching the amazing and wonderful military that we have in this country. I'll absolutely take a deep look at that. And as I understand it from reports I have, it's uh, the best practice and it, it leads the nation in its skills. It, it does. It does, in fact. And my thanks to you and your family for your service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Milley, uh, good to see you. Thank you for your 35 years of service and to your family. I know you sacrificed a lot. I wanted to talk. I have a number of questions, as you can imagine, about the uh, Army's decision to cut 40,000 troops recently. I know that you, uh, you, you weren't in the ultimate decision making, but um, you're going to be tasked with implementing this or maybe re-looking at it, so I'd appreciate some of your thoughts and views. You know, General Dunford last week talked about the importance of the military and DOD focusing on and implementing the defense guidance from the Congress and whether it's, uh, you know, I, I gave examples of if the CNO was told by the, by the Congress 11 carriers we need or the chief of the Air Force, uh, chief of staff of the Air Force, um, we need A-10s, even though the service doesn't like it, uh, they do it. So one of the things that I'm concerned about is in the current NDAA, we have a lot of focus on the Pacific rebounds. And there's very strong language, very directive language. Uh, the United States forces under the OPCON of PACOM should be increased. Any withdrawal of United States forces outside the continental United States, Asia Pacific region would therefore seriously undermine the rebounds. A lot of focus on the rebounds. It was put in there to provide credibility to a strategy that this Congress bipartisan supports. So I've been quite concerned that the Army's decision pretty much ignores this. So I would, with all due respect to Senator Hirono, I don't think the decisions were inevitable. As a matter of fact, I think that what was just announced takes a huge chunk, not only increasing forces, not only keeping them the same, but dramatic increase. As a matter of fact, of the 40,000, a huge proportion was from the Asia Pacific region. So the idea of fighting tonight, maintaining the rebalance, I think it's all undermined. I think it's dramatically undermined. And I think our allies are going to see it undermined. So do you think that the President's rebalance strategy has been undermined by dramatically reducing forces despite this Congress's defense guidance to the Department of Defense to not do that? I don't think it's uh, necessarily been undermined, Senator. From an Army perspective, about 20 percent of the Army's combat power is in the Pacific, uh, even with the reductions. But uh, more to your point, though, uh, I agree that the sense of the Congress should absolutely inform decision making on uh, and we should take that seriously, and I think we will. And, and I look no, but it doesn't look like you did in, in this case. Well, as you know, I. I wasn't in the no, I know. I'm but not, again, a General, I have the utmost respect for you. I'm talking about the Army's right. decision, which now you're, yeah, you're going to affirm you're going to have to defend. And I, and I Congress, will, the, 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 Department, the Department of Defense, the Army, did not, did not abide by the defense guidance of the Congress, period, if they read that NDAA amendment. I will take a hard look at uh, the entire uh, issue, uh, and I look forward to working with you on it. Uh, but I do think. Senator, that the Army has substantial capabilities committed to the Pacific. But they've been significantly increased in the last two weeks, according to this decision. Uh, the only airborne combat brigade in the entire Asia Pacific has now been gutted. I would say that the airborne brigade was brought down to a battalion task force uh, with the specific intent and design uh, that it could be reversed if funding becomes available over the next couple of years. That battalion, that brigade doesn't go to a battalion 
I don't think until uh, 16 or late 16 or 17. So it's designed to go to a battalion task force with the intent of reversing it if funding is made available. Do you think our allies were supportive of this? I mean, the idea of fighting tonight in Korea, that BCT was the reserve cavalry for any contingency in Korea that can get there in seven hours, a very capable mountain, cold weather unit. You think that our capability in Korea has been decreased by this decision? Uh, the Army, Marines, uh, both have significant ground capabilities that are positioned throughout continental United States, Hawaii, Alaska, Fort Lewis, Washington, and Okinawa that uh, can respond, and we think that uh, it is a capable response to mitigate the threat uh, given the current situation. Mr. Chairman, I'll have uh, more questions in the second round. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member for this hearing. Uh, thank you so much, General Milley, for your service. Uh, thanks to your family. Uh, you've done extraordinary things, and I'm so grateful that you are continuing to serve our country. I want to talk a little bit about combat in integration. I want to applaud the Army for taking steps towards eliminating combat exclusion policies for women by opening up over 20,000 combat engineer and associated skill positions to female soldiers in June. As you look at the positions that still remain closed, what reasons might there be for the Army to ask for an exception to policy for a position? Uh, the only reason at all, Senator, if, and there's been no decision yet, but uh, everything revolves around standards mm -hmm. and readiness. Uh, so the military occupational specialties that remain closed currently, infantry armor, uh, some uh, forward observers uh, in the uh, field artillery, and then special operations, special forces. Uh, there's a study, a gender integration study ongoing right now by Training and Doctrine Command. There's a similar study ongoing by the Marines. They're both uh, crosswalking their, their data. I expect to see that information uh, if I'm confirmed, probably in September, October, have to make a decision or a recommendation to the Secretary of Defense whether to seek a waiver or not. And so uh, I'll take a hard look at all that data and, and, and make that call at that time. Well, we've seen the success of the cultural support teams in Afghanistan and how vital women were to those missions to gather vital intelligence as to where terrorists were, where weapons were being housed uh, from women and children in those homes. So I do hope you'll focus every effort to make sure our best and brightest and all of our best and brightest are serving. Um, I was concerned about the recent news regarding the eight women who failed the first phase of the Army Ranger School for the second time due to their inability to accomplish subjectively evaluated leadership tasks. These women were Army officers ranging from captains to majors with years of leadership experience. Why do you think that class of women, uh, why do you think that the class of these women were in such a historically high attrition rate? And do you find it alarming that the U.S. Military Academy at West Point is graduating leaders who, after five to six years of service, are not able to complete leadership tasks that are successfully accomplished by specialists and private first classes? Yes, Senator, uh, range schools are very, very hard course. Male, female, uh, no matter who you are, that is a hard course with a high attrition rate. Um, so uh, the women that have that failed, one of the key tasks that they failed uh, were patrolling tasks, leadership skills, uh, which uh, because they are not in the infantry uh, already, uh, they have had a limited opportunity to train to those. I expect that those skills would improve over time. Uh, but the, uh, right now we have three women who are in the mountain phase, as of yesterday anyway, uh, still in the mountain phase of ranger school. And uh, we're observing that and to see how that goes. Uh, the broader issue of, of, uh, of women in the infantry, women in armor, et cetera, again, there's a very detailed study going on. I want to take a hard look at all that and make sure that uh, the standards are being met in the readiness force. As whether women can fight or not, there's no doubt. I've seen it personally up close and, and, and real. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that women can engage in ground combat with uh, the enemies of our nation because they've done it. They've been doing it for 10 years. Mm. Um, I also want to associate myself with the remarks from Senator Ernst Hirono and McCaskill about sexual assault in the military and how important it is for this committee that we solve that problem. Um, I do want to just note one thing from your testimony. Retaliation is not a new issue. In fact, we've been measuring retaliation over the last several um, years uh, because of our DOD surveys. And one of the biggest challenges we have and why Senator McCaskill raised it is this year's survey, 62% of survivors were retaliated against, perceived retaliation 
uh, because they reported these crimes. That's the same statistic as two years ago. It's the same as the 20, 2012 survey. So uh, we have a real challenge here with retaliation. And to be clear, um, the retaliation is, is fairly diverse. 62% uh, is, 53% um, is social retaliation, peer-to-peer. 35% is administrative action, 32% is professional retaliation, and 11% is punishment for an infraction. So if, if you look at all of those factors, 35, 32, and 11, um, arguably more than half the retaliation is through the chain of command. So please do study that, because there is a issue of perception by female members of the military uh, of discrimination. It, it, they said in 60% of sexual harassment cases and sexual discrimination cases, it came from the immediate commander. So you're talking about unit commanders who are perhaps um, creating a toxic uh, climate. And so that command climate really needs to be looked at aggressively to make sure that these female soldiers know that they can succeed and that their immediate supervisor doesn't have it out for them. I will make that a focus area, Senator. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, General Milley, for um, your service to our country and for your willingness to um, uh, be considered for this position. I really enjoyed our visit last week uh, when we met. I enjoyed getting to know you a little bit better. I, I want to first join my colleagues in condemning the deplorable attacks against our service members in Chattanooga last week. Um, I, I pray for the friends, family members, and the colleagues of the five service members who lost their lives. And uh, I pray for a quick recovery for those who were injured. The attacks in Chattanooga last week uh, were the latest in a string of deadly assaults on military personnel and facilities in the United States, including Fort Hood and the Navy Yard, as well as a number of attacks that were planned, but that quite fortunately were disrupted before they could be carried out. In the coming months, I hope our military leaders in Congress can work together and uh, work in, a, in an efficient and effective manner to figure out how we can better protect our men and women in uniform from these types of attacks in the future. One of the concerns that I've heard repeatedly from service members in Utah and elsewhere is that they feel inadequately informed by military leadership about some of the persistent threats against themselves, uh, their families, and uh, the facilities where they happen to work. Uh, they see threats on the news or through social media, but they don't feel like they've been given enough information about what's being done to protect them or proper guidance on how to protect themselves at or away from their workplace. General, what's your assessment of how such information is being disseminated through the Army? And if confirmed, what you might do to improve the effectiveness of information and guidance that's coming from Army leadership on, on these threats to our homeland and to our service members in particular? Senator, uh, you know, as, unfortunately in today's world, there's no rear area in this battle against uh, the, the terrorists of ISIS or, or any other terrorist organization uh, in the rear area of the United States is, is in fact, vulnerable. And we have to do a better job at making sure that vulnerability assessments uh, and information awareness is out there with our soldiers and their families. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind we have to increase that uh, throughout the force, throughout the total army, and indeed throughout the entire military. Uh, there's things like uh, what to look for, signs, uh, indicators and warnings, of uh, reconnaissance and surveillance by, uh, by enemy, by the terrorists, uh, on a particular compound or against a particular person. Uh, unfortunately, though, a lot of these type of attacks are very ambiguous. Uh, this one in Chattanooga uh, may or may not have uh, had recon ahead of time or any kind of indicators ahead of time. May or may not have been a lone wolf. We don't know yet. It's too early in the investigation. But a lot of times these things are very ambiguous. Uh, so both active and passive defensive measures at all of our installations, with all of our families, with all of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, is going to be uh, a necessary requirement in the current environment. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate your insight on that. I, um, I next wanted to follow up on uh, some questions that Senator Wicker asked or, and some comments that he made. Among the most contentious issues in this committee over the, over the past two years 
has involved the, the Army's aviation restructuring initiative. Now, I understand the Army has uh, been put in a difficult position by budget reductions and over the past several years has been exploring a number of options to maximize combat power while at the same time figuring out how to cut costs. Congress has similarly been taking a hard look at this, which is why the Commission on the Structure of the Army uh, was established in the NDAA. Uh, if, if confirmed, will you commit to thoroughly reviewing the, uh, the Army's aviation restructuring initiative and working closely with Congress once the Commission reports delivered next year to help us figure out the best path forward on Army structure issues? Absolutely will, and I look forward to reviewing that Commission report. And um, what, what, what do you think are the, the uh, biggest threats that, um, should you be confirmed, you'll have to prepare the Army to address in the coming decade? I think the Army's fundamental mission uh, of engaging in ground combat, winning in ground combat, uh, I think that mission remains sound, and I anticipate that mission will remain so in the future. Uh, the three key tasks uh, in the national uh, security documents that are out there is to assure allies, deter opponents, and if necessary, uh, fight and win on the ground. Uh, and all of those are going to be challenges in the, in the years ahead as we go forward. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General, I wanted to talk, you talked about budget constraints and looking at ways to reduce those. One, of, one that you didn't mention is making sure there's no overlap in terms of core competencies and missions. I'm assuming you think a core competency of the Army, I certainly do, is uh, the Airborne Brigade Task Force, the ability to deploy anywhere on a moment's notice, kick in the door. Uh, airborne operations are a core competency of the United States Army. That's correct. So one of the things that I've been somewhat concerned about is um, when you look at the Army's Pacific Pathways mission, my office has been asking the Army for weeks now on what the costs of that are. Uh, we haven't been able to get any answers uh, on that. But to me, you see the value of, uh, in terms of our nation's defense, uh, a BCT with regard to the Army or putting soldiers on naval shipping with uh, helicopters and doing expeditionary maneuver throughout the Pacific. What's a higher value for the Army? I think they're both of value to the Army. Uh, and I do think that Army forces on, on shipping uh, and moving them around the Pacific has been done really for over a century. Uh, that's how the Army moves, by air and by ship. Uh, so the You don't see that as redundant to the Marine Corps mission in the Asia Pacific? No, not at all. The, uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, they complement each other, but the Marine Corps court competency is amphibious assault, not just movement by sea. What we're really talking about for Pacific Pathways is the strategic movement of Army forces over the ocean. Uh, and we're not using any gray hulls anyway to do that. We're using black and green hulls to do that. So, so if you had to choose, though, in yeah. austere budget times, would the Army want to focus on airborne core competencies or a mission that, in some people's view, looks somewhat redundant to another services? Well, frankly, Senator, the Army has to do both. Uh, it's no, but I'm just asking if you had to choose. In this kind of austere budget, sure, you have to choose. Um, we have to be able to do both. We have to. We, we don't have a choice. We have to maintain both capabilities, forced entry capability from vertical insertion, airborne assault, and we have to be able to move forces, both air and sea, to reinforce on a variety of contingencies. So it'd be, we'd, we'd appreciate, I'd appreciate if we can get some numbers on the Pacific Pathways in terms of costs. Sure, absolutely. So I want to turn to another issue, kind of a emerging threat issues. And, uh, you know, you and many others who have testified have talked about Russia as a principal threat. Um, and certainly that's the case in the Ukraine. I want to emphasize and talk a little bit more about the, the Arctic. And you've probably seen in the last just a few weeks, there's been articles. It's got this in the, the uh, airport today. Uh, Russia has made military buildup in the Arctic a strategic priority. Uh, there's article after article about the Russians moving huge force posture, huge force structure, four new BCTs, big operations that nobody's even aware of that are taking us by surprise. All through the Arctic, you've probably seen this map 
that has new airfields, 11 new airfields, 40 Arctic icebreakers, some nuclear uh, powered. The U.S. has these forces here. That's it. Uh, this recent decision, we're going to remove a key capability of these in. We have this as our strategy. This was the 2013 DOD Arctic strategy, mentions climate change five times and in a footnote mentions Russia. This is a, this is a joke of a strategy. And I think in the, um, during our deliberations for the NDAA, the Congress recognized that this is a serious issue, a serious new threat environment. So we had a amendment that came through the NDAA that focused on our interest in the Arctic, the need for a much broader assessment, for a much more serious look in terms of O plans, in terms of a military strategy, and um, that passed unanimously. Um, but what I was wondering, when you look at, so the Secretary of Defense has to put forward this strategy within the next year, and yet our most capable Arctic forces, before we even do the analysis, before we do the planning, before we do the O plan, we're going to remove the most capable, indeed the most lethal Arctic warriors that we have. And as you know, General, uh, it takes a long time to become proficient in the Arctic. So I'm wondering what your thought on that is, and if confirmed, I think it makes sense to do the analysis first, to do the O plan first, to do the strategy first, before we move any force structures. Would you commit to work with this committee to hold off on moving Arctic forces, particularly given the dramatic threat increase, until after the Secretary of Defense and others have put together an Arctic strategy as defense guidance from this committee and this Congress, do you think that that's the most logical way to do the planning? I appreciate that, uh, Senator, and, and I agree with you. I think that having an O plan first and then figuring out your task organization second is, is the right sequence, and I think that is, in fact, what's about to happen. Uh, I think, as uh, you already mentioned, the Arctic O plan, the Arctic strategy, is going to get reviewed by the uh, OSD, and, and General Dunford mentioned that the other day. Well, there, there is I, no O plan. There, there is no strategy. No, you asked him. Unless you want to call this a strategy. So, I mean, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, and it's under review, as I understand it. And I think you asked General Dunford to produce an O plan, and I think he committed to doing that, and I look forward to participating in that. Uh, and and uh, we'll work with that uh, over the course of the next year. Uh, the forces in Alaska don't get reduced, according to the decision I think I heard, uh, don't get reduced uh, until uh, seven, end of 16 and 17. So an O plan first, reduction of forces second, uh, if still required. And, I, and I'll work with you on that. Good. Because uh, to me, again, I think it makes strategic sense, put together the plan, see what the combatant commanders need in terms of troops, see what the new threat level is, and then make the plan on troop levels once you're informed by a real strategy, not a 13-page document. Thank you. Uh, yeah. General, I'd just like to say that uh, Senator Sullivan raises this whole issue of the Arctic and the recent Russian moves in that region. We need to pay a lot more of attention to it. We see our friends. Uh, in Norway in particular, but also Sweden, Finland, those uh, nations there that are experiencing things like Russian overflights and Russian submarine activities and other. Uh, I believe that the Russians have, uh, what is it, uh, Senator Sullivan, 50-some icebreakers? Close to 40. Close to 40 icebreakers. I think we have one. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, so, We've got a very full agenda, but the Arctic, I think, is another area that we have to be concerned, particularly given Russian uh, behavior. Even Sweden, which is traditionally, uh, as we know, a very neutral nation, has become extremely concerned about Russian activity in their territorial waters. And as we see climate change, or, uh, as we see 
areas of the Arctic opening up to being oceans, uh, uh, areas of navigation. This is an area that I hope we will spend some time on. And I thank Senator Sullivan for his uh, attention and involvement in what is, I view, a looming situation with Russia. I, th I thank you, General.